Yes, hello. Here we are. Hateful Eight. The most hateful of the eight. Yes. There have uh, never been more hateful eight. There's eight of them. They're just so hateful. Uh, you want to run into public reception first here? I would love right to hear what the, the public thought. Yeah. Rotten Tomatoes, according to the uh, tomato meter, which is the critics, uh, what would you guess this is? Uh, I'm going to think it's pretty up there. I'm going to go with an 87. 75. 75, okay. A little lower than I thought it would be, honestly. So as opposed to the critics, the audience score, what would you say? 81. 77. Really? Okay, yeah. so they were battle line there. Hmm. Yeah, I think this movie uh, honestly gets a little... Um, little flack for being slow you know which uh i would agree with it is definitely a slower slower movie uh we get into some of the uh reviews let's go for bad ones because love it love them uh the hateful eight may be really sort of bad terrible <laughs> <laughs> the hateful eight often feels more like a sadistic stage play than a movie full review in japanese on this one interesting konnichiwa <laughs> Some of Tarantino's worst instincts are on display in The Hateful Eight, which, damn it, could have been so great. Hmm. And we got a lot of good ones. We'll read a couple good ones. Uh, while it's not his best film, it's fair. It's far too long and indulgent at times. Uh, Tarantino absorbs the audience into a scene, compelling you to look at each and every inch of it, indicative of many vintage films. His usual film, Playground. Uh, glorious, unhinged, wildly unpredictable, yet subtly existential piece of work. Not sure how existential I felt after no. this, but... Uh, when looking at Tarantino's filmography, The Hateful Eight doesn't hold a candle to works like Pulp Fiction or Kill Bill, but it's an entertaining film nonetheless, if you don't mind the runtime. All fair. Definitely a long movie, definitely a slower burn, but... Yeah. I, I, I think you kind of go in this knowing what to expect, right? It's going to be dialogue heavy. You know, it's kind of that time piece, so you have to just understand even what normal people would be talked about at that time, and obviously with a little bit of that modern embellishment. That's well, Tarantino. We, we know what to expect, right? You know, yeah. Everybody everybody talks too long for shit you don't know what the hell it is, and, you know, it's... Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so taking that into our likes dislikes um i i like the way the story's told it's classic tarantino shit i like tarantino i like the way he tells stories I like the way he flushes things out i like the way um you know you start at one point and then you know there is a backstory to tell and i love being filled in later i love the kind of oh moment you know yeah. i think those are fun uh so i like that um and I don't like Michael Madsen, but uh, Michael Madsen's voice is perfect for the gimmick of the door. You know, when everybody keeps opening the door and everyone needs new instructions every single time. Yeah. And just his voice over there going, Shut the goddamn door! Yeah. It's a goddamn blizzard out there! It's cold enough in here! It's so good. It's, <laughs> it's uh, really the only purpose he serves. Because, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I feel bad because I, I feel like I just say michael madsen shit every time but he's the same goddamn actor in every movie he just squints he just does this a lot talks slower you know now that he's old he's got a gruff voice when he was young he talked like this in reservoir dogs you know like he just he just squints man yeah like he's not <laughs> there's there's not a lot of depth to whatever he's doing he's you know, just a guy who's <laughs> there to collect his paycheck young young him Kind of reminds me of that, uh, you know, the Liberty Mutual commercial with like the young struggling actor. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's exactly what I think Liberty of. Him. Liberty. <laughs> that's, that's young Michael Madsen, right? Uh, yeah, but so uh, yeah, but I love Sam Jackson. I think he's great in just about everything he does. Um, he's the king. And uh, you know, some people would say that they maybe don't like this movie because of the dialogue. I think. He's, Tarantino's like the best writer of dialogue there is, honestly. And, um, you know, the first couple times I watched it, like it was like, oh man, this is really long. But I think the more I watch it, the more I think you pick up on everything. And I think you go like, okay, well, he doesn't just 
write dialogue just to be self-indulgent. He's self not filling screen time. Right. Yeah. Like, he has a he has such a masterful way of writing dialogue that, you know, is both entertaining, you know, in just the, like, shoot the shit kind of way, but also uh, is setting things up for later. Like, you know, in the stagecoach with the whole, like, oh, you know, a lot of people came headhunting for Warren in the mountains, but, you know. Yeah. A lot of them got killed, and then that sets up the whole thing with the general later, which, you know, we can discuss if we think Warren is full of shit or not <laughs> on his story. But, uh, you know, so it's stuff like that. And as far as dislikes, um, not a ton. Just, uh, <sighs> I, I mean, because, like, I kind of wrote this paragraph of saying, like, but the paragraph basically just says, like, why I don't have dislike about it anymore it's really just so some of the plot holes of it which are better conversation pieces so fair just yeah go ahead yeah so dialogue obviously is going to be number one up there it's it's always entertaining it's it's such a good way to kind of set the tone kind of give you context without telling you the whole whole story um which is something I, i just really enjoy and think gets done well whenever you know we get these kinds of dialogue you know we we get kind of those bits and pieces of backstory and context and things that come to fruition later um, that just feel very natural at the time they're presented, but you can still go back on that second, third watch and be like, oh, like we had, you know, those small references. Um, and just, and it's an extremely dynamite, dynamite way to do dialogue. It's, it's, it's perfect. Um, da, 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 da. Um, I really thought that this was going to be... Um, uh, going into this, it was going to be like an every man for himself, you know, type of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I was kind of picturing, uh, uh, you know, just like everyone would think that they're double crossing each other or that everyone's out to get them. Sure. And like, they're all wrong. You know, I kind of like that. Uh, you know, I was expecting the struggle for not aspect to kind of come in, which still does yeah. realistically, but kind of had that in mind where this was going to be just like a everyone thinks somebody else is out to get him and we're just uh you know making a lot of mistakes and assumptions along the way mostly just john ruth yeah Felt honestly yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but i just thought that was really fun but yeah no no real dislikes on this one the, the runtime was long but it, i really only felt like it was dragging for me in the beginning i think kind of once we hit like that 30 minute mark mm -hmm. um i felt like that pace was starting to pick up and i was just more engaged and you know the conversations and it, it really started to flow for me yeah honestly if you thought this was long you watch the extended version they break it up into four episodes like it's a series mm -hmm. and it's uh i think like 53 minutes 53 minutes 56 minutes 53 minutes are the episodes okay <laughs> so it's uh it's a lot and there are a lot more flushed out things uh, i think i did the math it was like I can't remember the exact minute totals, but I think totaled out like three hours, 10 minutes at that point. That's rough. Yeah. I want to say like regular runtime was like two thirty seven, yeah. two forty or something. So, <laughs> but, uh, there was a couple things they flushed out that I thought, um, are useful, but obviously not crucial. Yeah. There was know, a reason this still worked. Yeah. Um, but there is, uh, I have it written down in here. I mean, there's a couple dumb things, right? Like, there's a longer conversation like with OB when, you know, uh, Warren convinces OB to like, go help him store the bodies, you know, it's like dumb shit like that. There's a, uh, <laughs> more drawn out conversation on whether or not he, Warren knows the guy up the road that ends up being Chris Mannix. Um, you know, John Roos taking a piss when he asks him to, <laughs> You know, hey, can you hold the horses while OB and I load yeah. the load the bodies onto the roof? So, and then like the taking away everybody's guns is a longer drawn out situation because then there's a shotgun hanging on the wall, and you know he like breaks the shotgun against the post, and then you know it's a whole like it's climactic so thing, and then can you not disassemble you know, a shotgun? <laughs> well, it's very wasteful because they dump the rest of the gun parts down the shitter anyway. Yeah, right? I which, guess. Which I thought, you know. I think just if just as effective a, a method would just be you know toss the shit out in the snow yeah because I mean no one's ever gonna find all that you know but you have to have Ob come back and be mad that he was <laughs> sent out. I'm there. not going back out there again. Fuck. <laughs> he draws a short straw. And he's got to go back out there again. Yeah. So that's extended. Uh, but the, really the only important thing I thought was uh, you know when they give you the little reveal of. 
uh, you know, the gang getting there earlier that day and all that, and then they, you know, full swing, you know, then they walk back in, you know, kind of cut back to where the present time, right? Right. Um, there's a little more of an extended part where, you know, they let him walk in, the coffee and everything, they show all that again, and when he's over there gra- grabbing coffee beans, um, you know, Joe Gage is holding the pistol under the table because he's like, because what he says before he goes down, he's like, unless we get a chance in the first 45 seconds, he's here. And I was like, yeah, whatever. I don't know and about you. I'm pretty confident I could have taken him out in the first 45 seconds. Dude, I, dude, they had a whole like 15 minutes before anybody else came in that it would have been a pretty, you know, it would have had a good advantage against him you yeah. know i mean there was i mean he shit even just after he nailed the door yeah you know what i mean like <laughs> while nailing the door yeah while nailing the door like strangle him take him down all stealthy like and then as the other guys come in just yago him as soon as they come in yeah it wasn't that hard <laughs> it really wasn't uh, but which it, is, it seemed like yeah. it was intentionally like a, a little bit of a level of theatrics like they wanted to go along with it yeah. for, honestly from everybody everybody wanted a little bit of theatric involved with this scenario yeah well i mean I'll, and like i don't know that's just because like that's why i didn't throw it in dislikes because like they're like it's like holes but you know like I, every good plot has like a hole like, yeah. you know what i mean like so much of it is just for show but so anyway, he's like holding the pistol under the table, and when Daisy like randomly like walks in front of John, like walks back and forth the other side of him, and he says, she says, you know, Sheriff Red Rock's traveling with us, like that's kind of like her deterrent of like, no, 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 play it slow, you know. Sure. Uh, you know, and then like Mowbray's, you know, going like, you know, trying to like scoot her over. She's like, he's motioning his hand like, move over. Um, I don't know. So that's like one cool thing. Yeah. But uh, and there's one scene where. Uh, before you know, he take uh, John Ruth takes everybody's guns. Uh, he's eating peaches, and Daisy's taking a piss next to him, which is just inherently a funny scene because he's got that big mustache and he's just <laughs> eating canned peaches. And uh, then he sees a half pluck chicken on the piano, and he goes up to Bob and he's like, "It's like half pluck chicken's a sign of bad luck. Finish plucking this chicken." And that's why Bob was randomly plucking the chicken. That at makes the sense piano. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow, Bob's really trying to sell this. Like, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, that was interesting. But, yeah, really didn't add a lot yeah. in the extended version. It would have been interesting, though, just to have some of those, like, early frames reshot from, like, the, the gang's perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, just to kind of show, like, that, um, you know, we were very focused on John and Morin and all of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so just to see a lot more of that kind of, like, hesitancy and those looks at each other and everything. Yeah. I do think that is, is pretty cool. The one, you know what? If I did have to say one dislike, I would have liked an angle, like it doesn't have to be obvious, but I would have liked an angle where you could see that someone was poisoning the coffee. Yeah, like just you know, if it's just one of those like, oh, here's the whole room, and it's not, you know, they're like, it's not the focus, barely yeah. in frame. You know, I would have just liked to be able to find. I don't know. I like to play along at home. You know. Right. It's it's fun when you much do like that. the scream commentary. Yeah. That we I was just, I was trying into, to uh, pick it out from the gloves, but like yeah. you know, four of them had black gloves on. You know, so I was like, well, yeah. I mean, I, I we <laughs> only knew it wasn't Warren, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I mean, Bob, I guess, because he was playing the piano. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, there was a couple times where I like went kind of frame by frame through that, and it's like, you what am I missing? Where nothing. are you? So anyway, uh, we move into our bad section. Uh, bad trailer, you know, sometimes a movie, movie trailer makes it looks like, makes it look like, you know, a movie's going to be kind of about something else. You get to the movie, you're a little surprised. So, um, you know, what we do here is try to pick, make one of those with scenes from the movie that could make it funnier. Right. So, um, I said, maybe you could stage this to be a movie about like a, like a plague going around. Right. It could start with uh, the half plug chicken lying on the piano bench. You know, and John Ruth from the extended version going up to Bob and like, what is this? And like, just cut there, right? Uh, and then, you know, you get a shot of Daisy with all the guts all over her face after her brother gets shot. Right. But, you know, obviously you don't see show that context, but she's just like, ah! right. Um, you know, you have the pile of bodies on top of the carriage. Dude, you, you know? could 100% frame this as like a plague, like apocalypse zombie movie type of thing. Yeah. Oh, then, man, that's actually really good. You get the shots of like John and Obi throwing up blood. Yeah. And, and, then, and then honestly, like if you cut out the 
the gunshots part, you just have a shot of Bob's head exploding <laughs> right. for no reason. <laughs> so I don't know. It could be a good plague movie. That, that'd plague be trailer. really good, actually. Yeah. Um, so what I had was uh, I wanted just a, like a three minute compilation of girl getting the shit beat out of her the whole movie. Just like every single scene where like she was hit, slapped, thrown out of something. I just wanted this to be like a, you know, puked on. Yeah. The <laughs> worst day of your life kind of thing. Um, but then also I thought it would be uh, interesting to kind of frame this as like a, like a torture porn horror movie, you know, cause yeah. you gotta have the finisher of them like hanging her up at the end, you know? Right. Uh, just to be like, hey, we're just going to torture this poor girl. Make it look as brutal as possible. Yeah. What do you got for a bad summary? Uh, bad summary. The first reported case of cabin fever. All right. <laughs> uh, I said unconventional surprise vasectomy goes wrong and oh. in a room full of people dead. Dude, I got to tell you, uh, number one, just because we also had an odd focus of this in Django. With, like, just the, the, the balls hanging out and it all just being right there in focus. Number yeah. one, it's weird when we just get to see some cock and balls in, in a movie. Just yeah. at any point, it's always just odd to see that we were like, yep, cock yeah. and balls. <laughs> Check. Check. We got it. <laughs> let's let's get our, uh, our billion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it's just right there in center. But then there's, I just feel like there's always something that happens to the cock and balls. Yeah. And it's just, it makes me, makes me wheezy. Yeah. If I never had to see them, like if they weren't as prevalent and we yeah. didn't focus on it and we just got to assume it. But when he's actually saying, I'm like, I shot my nuts off. I love when he's going to sit up and he <laughs> leans over and he's like, I can't feel my ass no more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, that was real good. So, uh, yeah, my bad casting was, uh, so San Andreas came out that year with The Rock. I said, let's make Warren The Rock. Sure. Um, Paul Blart 2 was that year, so <laughs> no. I said, let's make Kevin James John Ruth. Uh, and uh, Michael Madsen is Joe Gage. Oh, wait. Sorry. Oh, wait. <laughs> He's um, already there. Uh, Furious 7 was that year, so I said, let's make uh, Chris Mannix Vin Diesel. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um. I thought we had to replace Warren with Kevin Hart just so we had all of the sass but none of the intimidation, right? I thought about Will Ferrell and Kevin Hart because it was a uh, get hard that year. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I wanted uh, Sam Elliott as John Ruth um, just to have all of the same exact dialogue but just the most polite delivery as possible. Yeah. So it's like you just have the weirdest vibe about this guy who's like really aggressive with the words. Yeah. But like just talking all calm and smooth. That would be just dynamite. Smooth but threatening. Smooth but threatening. And that's what I want to be you yeah. know, when I grow up. <laughs> um, and I wanted something that was real off the wall. So I wanted Vern Troyer as OB and nobody acknowledges the height difference or anything about him. Like he's just part <laughs> of the crew. Yeah. Like he has like a fumble off of the stagecoach and like no one just acknowledges like it. plants yes. face down in the snow. There's like His a comedic hole. Up. Yeah. <laughs> I would love that so much. Just no acknowledgement. He's just part of the crew, just a regular guy. Yeah. Because I think he was still alive at the time. I think he still had a couple years left uh, <laughs> before he passed, though. So. I dig it. Yeah. Uh, let's have some talking points. Uh, so I thought it was very interesting that a big part of this plot really hinges on the fact that John Ruth is just very stubborn about wanting to bring this bount like all his bounties in to hang rather than just shoot them and bring them in yeah you know and like i understand if that's your practice but then it seems like there are quite a few points along the way where it would just make this trip easier for him if he won just said no to some of the people that wanted to get in the wagon uh but number two um you know if he would just shoot her and throw her up top you know because i mean granted it definitely turns into kind of a different movie right. when he gets there and then it probably just turns into a revenge plot type shootout kind of immediately yeah because i i um, can't see how uh they would have gone as long as they did um if it didn't have warren and uh, uh mannix right so so <laughs> but i mean i don't know just a big part of it hinges on like just shooter like it'll be and like even the people for daisy per se you know he, you know, Mowbray's like, hmm, seems like you would just kill your bounty and bring him in, you know? Yeah. Um, but, like, what yeah. luck that, number one, that the guy that did capture her is the guy that's going to bring her in alive. And then, number two, 
um, that all these guys got that information and had enough time to plan this whole thing ahead of time. Right. You know, very, very convenient. Well, and what what, what would the deal be with, with Mowbray? I mean, so Warren's probably right. Like, you, pro- like you think there is a real whatever his name oswaldo mowbray yeah you know in a ditch somewhere and he got the papers and you know now he's posing as the hangman which is just a very interesting like subplot because then you know he's actually got the proof of like oh yeah i do have the papers to hang that guy you're talking about that shot the old sheriff when the new sheriff comes in town unless these guys like you know part of just what is you know they are comfortable doing is creating forgeries you know if they can write up paperwork you know then they can say anything and that that just fits the bill so Mm, i wouldn't discount that is that there might not even be a mowbray and that there's just a guy who you know is good at forging documents or they got somebody or you know Mm. something like that so but yeah Do you think that's a thing that wasn't thought about? Like, do you think, like, it just kind of happened to be... Like, that's why I think maybe there is a guy in a ditch, right? Yeah. I mean, knowing... he just happens to have the papers, because I don't think they were counting on Chris Mannix rolling into town with him. Because John Ruth, I don't think, you know, unless they just went to the T's and just were like, no, we're going to plan for everything. If he asks for proof that I am a hangman, like, I'm going to have cards, I'm going to have forgery... You know, of like, you know, bills to kill people. It's a lot of prep work Let's involved. Let's do some research. Who, who, who's to hang? You know, in town soon. You know, so he probably did kill a guy. There's probably a guy yeah. in a ditch. The real Oswald. I mean, and, and that's that's a good point because there, I think, is a lot less left up to you know uh, interpretation. You know, they 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 know what the story is, even if not everything is on screen. They know what the story is. So I, they probably did have a guy in a dead in the ditch somewhere. Yeah. And they were like, well, you know, if we ever need him, we do have about 45 seconds of footage of this guy in a ditch out back. So <laughs> if it doesn't fit by the end, we can just shove that in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got. It. Yeah. Um, so uh, because of the, the dialogue, after, like I said, the first 30 minutes after I got past that point of it being kind of slow, I was I was immersed into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it didn't really kind of click until we were wrapping up at the end and we did kind of the... Uh, uh, the the gang getting there, uh, you know, killing everyone and uh, you know prepping the stage uh, as it was. Right. Um, it wasn't until that point that I was like, wow, pretty much this whole movie is just inside of this cabin. Yeah. Um, which is is just really impressive to me. Um, because there's there's no I guess gimmick involved when when you're just isolated to like one spot and it's just a bunch of people and then you just have a fucking three hour movie. Yeah. Like there's there's just no gimmick involved. It's just we're here. This is an interaction. Like this is just what everybody, as an individual and as a group, is going through. Um, and I just think that uh, that kind of snapshot is cool. But mm-hmm. um, I guess uh, how would this have worked if we got more of I guess like the backstory? So say if we got to more of like you know backstory of like if Mowbray was actually a person, kind of all the stuff that happened before the cabin. Do you think? all the stuff that happens inside the cabin would be quite as impactful because we have all these scene changes or do you think because we're anchored to the cabin that everything that happens there is that more meaningful because that's all we the audience know of well first of all it's probably a fucking series if you if you go into the background right because i mean i don't know how i mean unless you're saying like a good bit of our dialogue is cut from the cabin you know, and we do focus more on other places. Yeah. So I don't know how you do that, really. Like, do you? Do you do... Would it, would this be a hateful eight part one, part two, and we have seven hours of footage we split up across <laughs> Probably, two movies? Probably, yeah. Because I mean, I, I think the way you start that has got to be, you know, the old sheriff getting shot, right? And then, I, right? I mean, I don't like. Know. There's and, like, so many small things that we can kind of spoke out to from the I think the only way this works is if it's this movie you know because I think you have to if you if you try to go do a series there's too many yes the whole the whole thing with this movie is that everybody meets as one and it is like not so much a bottle episode like in TV right but a bottle movie you know and you're just you're just here and then we find out everybody's stories slowly I don't I don't know that it really works as a movie where we focus on the the other stuff the backstory i think yeah. it has to be slowly unfolded in the cabin and cabin whether it is 
lies or bullshit or you know what have you um and i guess that's yeah. fair right because if we have all the details if we get that screen time to get the backstory and we know who's bullshitting and who's not right off the bat yeah then that that kind of makes the cabin scenes less impactful yeah because then we know someone's lines just how good of a job are they going to do about it right bob yeah <laughs> well and you know you're kind of surprised like the fi- i mean you know I believed he had a Lincoln letter. There was no reason to believe otherwise. Yeah. Right. Uh, which then makes you f- suspicious on whether he was lying about the about the son, you know, killing him. Uh, fuck, I, I hate it when I do that. Yeah. Um. Oh well. See what I was kind of thinking along the lines of like with, uh, you know, at least as far as like shooting the general, unless you have a specific talking point about that, yeah. you can bring it up now. Um, I very much felt like it wasn't a real story and that he was just trying to either Shoot. number one, yeah. eliminate a candidate or number two, he still really enjoyed, you know, killing the South. Southern white crackers, as yeah. he said earlier. Yeah. So we won't say what the yeah. <laughs> Southern white crackers called him. But you know what I mean? I, to me, that felt intentional either way. We were goading him. I don't think the story was real. I think we were goading him into doing it. Uh, you know, General's famous enough that sure, you know, the name of his kids is probably rolling around in there. We had heard enough of that dialogue get spoken around of like, oh, yeah, he was in Wyoming. You know, we, we had some context that um, Warren could have picked up on mm-hmm. and spun this whole story. So I 100% think that it was a bullshit made up story. Um, and that we were just going on the general to eliminate him, either for getting rid of suspects or uh, because we want to kill Southern White Crackers. Sure. <laughs> the only reason I still have the suspicion it might be a little true is because, you know, just how specific. But like, it's the details, right? Like, now he could have just guessed and been like, and I grabbed a handful of that black hair. Which Could've is guessed. funny because in the cutaway they did, it looked pretty brown and not black to me. I so. think it was like black graying, sure, you know, type of deal. Yeah, it's all snowy. I don't know. But like, you know, our dude didn't flinch. Yeah. Right. Um, and I believe in that extended version. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's another thing in the extended where he's like uh, fucking Mannix is being teacher's pet over there. And so he's like, let's have a toast. To the state of Georgia, and 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 your son, you know, as he says about how his son dies, and they talk about it or whatever, say his name, and but like Warren is not in the building at that point, right? So there's no reason he would know his name, right? It's the little details why I think it probably is true, but again, he could have picked up on it, he could have been nosy, whatever. Yeah, I mean, um, he knew who the general was, so that's why I'm yeah. saying like it's likely that he that he might know who the kids are. You know, he knows who you know man it well. Did he know who Mannix was off the bat, or was that John Ruth? John Ruth knew. John Ruth, yeah, pointed out, but I don't know. Maybe maybe he just knows people, but yeah, maybe maybe it was real. Yeah. Well, I did, and I felt like they were set, because again, the whole thing with the you know Tarantino's dialogue is like, I don't feel like many things are an accident. So them setting up the whole deal about, you know, oh, many, many dudes came up there hunting for my head, but, you yeah. know, they found me. They didn't find a fortune, you know, all that whole deal. So, I don't know. It, it, it's 50-50. <laughs> I get you. But, I don't know. Um, yeah, let's see. We talked about that. Talked about... Kind of talked about they should have just ambushed John Ruth, and we talked about the hangman thing. Um, we have Red Apple Tobacco again, Tarantino's uh, signature Classic. universe yeah. uh, cigarette. He even says that he didn't... Did you catch that... Uh, when Bob has a cigarette, he's like, and Bob enjoyed a Manzana Roja. Yeah. Yeah, right up. Right. I thought that was funny. Uh, Number one, just the <laughs> uh, uh, the the dub over was. Yeah. Well, it was <laughs> funny to listen to, because I can't remember. He had somebody. Fuck. What was the last movie he had somebody narrate something? <sighs> In one of the previous movies, he had somebody narrate a certain sequence, but he had. Oh, well, it, it's going to bother me, so I'm not going to fuck with it right now. But it's th- it was funny that he did it this time. Sure. It was his voice doing it. Sam Jackson narrated something in another movie. Sam Jackson narrated in Inglorious Bastards. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So that yeah, that's what it was. And then I found it funny that yeah, it was Tarantino that did his own his narration on this one. Yeah, bold move. He probably couldn't find a place to stick himself, you know. So gotta gotta <laughs> still have a piece of the pie, right? Yeah. Uh, Warren story all bullshit. Yeah, we kind of <laughs> yeah we, we, we hit out. a lot of me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I thought uh, the hindsight of watching this movie again, right? It's kind of funny. Um, it's in so much a talking point, but or maybe a little bit. It really almost kind of gives it away that Daisy has a plan, uh, or knows something's going on when she doesn't make a move. Uh, when uh, John unhooks her, yeah, right. Um, because she could have just bolted for it if she thought it was hopeless, it or, you know. Yeah, if she thought she could kill kill a couple of them, you know. I know, you know. Two against one with Holt, with Warren there, and Mannix probably isn't on her side either, really. Um, but he still but sort of didn't remains. Know who a, she was? She could have damsel yeah. and stressed her way out of it. Yeah, she kind of re- he kind of remains a neutral party at that point. Um, but it kind of reveals that she knows something's up. Yeah, right. Uh, in hindsight, when you know, and they walk in. At first, Oswaldo does the whole, oh, a woman, you know, and she kind of does her little smile Come as if it's flattery yeah. or whatever, but she's kind of like, oh, I'm among friends. Yeah. You know, um, the Lincoln letter in the carriage the first time, you know, uh, John Ruth's all, you know, into it and he's watching it or er, er, watching it. <laughs> he's reading it and, uh, you know, Warren's watching him and, you know, he at first watch you know you watch and he's kind of like you know just observing him watching like oh that's fun you like it uh but you know on second watch his expressions could kind of go either way you know so i almost interpret his expressions you know the 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 last few times i watched it more as like a <laughs> you, fucking, you idiot. fucking idiot he's like i got you you know 100 um, percent stuff like that and you can interpret you know facial expressions of all the gang members within so i guess what i'm saying is uh it's not a great formula for a movie to uh have to get better on second third fourth watches you know it's um, supposed to be a treat not like a you know the movie's now better (laughs) like you have to watch this more than once um i don't know so is it a good strategy probably not on movies like this, but uh, but I, I do think there is always kind of like a uh, kind of that quality and like when you watch a movie. Number one, like I go see a movie, and then I'm like, Todd, we got to watch this movie, and then you watch it again, and you're like, holy shit, I got to explain to you some things I didn't notice the first time around. Yeah, like, I, I think when it's kind of done in that way, you still kind of get like that new hype, and maybe that's what makes you you know get more people to watch it. Maybe that's a little bit more of like the uh, uh, like crowd pleasing. So spread the word of yeah. mouth kind of thing. So what do you like more? A movie that is like really good on first watch? Because then I feel like some of those burn out on like second, third, fourth watches. Mm-hmm. Whereas a movie like this where you can keep noticing things and, you know, really get into nuances. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what do you prefer in that? So I, I take this back to the way I play video games most of the time. So I like to do 100% completions on a first playthrough whenever possible because I don't know when I'll be able to go back and play a game again. So if it's something to where I can get like the full experience on the first watch, for me that is kind of easier. If I can get everything, I go back and maybe look up some notes on like fun facts kind of thing. Um, but if it's something that like really requires like the multiple watch throughs, it has to be a very certain kind of movie for me to be about that. So for me personally... If I can get everything on the first watch, that's dynamite. Mm-hmm. Um, if I have to watch it multiple times, that doesn't land quite as well with me. Yeah, this is also a movie I got to be in a certain mood. So, like, I can't. Well, just... anything that's just a dialogue slog is. Yeah, you got to be ready. <laughs> yeah, it's just one of the. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, one of the things I did want to point out, though, so like when we were in the uh, uh, the stagecoach after we picked up Warren. Um, as he was reading the, as John Ruth was reading the Lincoln letter, I think there were a couple glances exchanged between Warren and Daisy and Daisy winked at him at one point. So I was starting to build like the idea of like, is it, you know, is he all along going to be number one, the guy who's working with her? Um, and then like number two, is he going to change sides or, you know, kind of change his mind or whatever? 
Um, so I, I always had that kind of sit in the back of my head all the way up through him getting shot in the nuts. Um, that if there, there, there might still be like a, a grand twist uh, from uh, Samuel L. Jackson's character. Yeah, wouldn't that have been a... That would have been pretty wild. But I think it would have been too much, right, for us to go through all, all, all of that hassle and, uh, you know, song and dance just to be like, ha! And then, you know, he kills everyone in five seconds because he's a professional. And then um, he... <laughs> But the funny part would be him killing, like, the other guys that are part of the gang because he doesn't know. Uh-huh. Like, he's just trying to, like, read all this, like, just he's off just the vibe and Daisy. just get the girl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I thought that would be uh, that'd be pretty funny. But, yeah, um, yeah so he, he was, like, my, my first pick kind of there. But then I was also, like, I suspect Obi the least. So yeah. then he's got to be more involved with something. Sure. Um, and then, like, immediately after I wrote down that note, he drank the coffee and started spitting up blood. So I was like, okay, maybe it's not OB. <laughs> but then I was like, maybe it's fake, and maybe he had something in his cup that was different to look like blood. Sure. And then I was I was too deep. There was no way. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, what do you got? So how, uh, uh, how fair unfair do you think it was that Jody was the secret character in the basement that comes in, you know, an hour and 30, 45 minutes into the movie. Fair and fair like how? Well, like, we know who all is involved pretty early on. You know, once we we get into the cabin, we know who our players are in the game. Yeah. And then at the, you know, kind of climax turning point, it's just like, oh, another guy in the basement. Sure. And like it's it's a grand reveal because of like what the intention was and you know we get the context on the plan. But I felt it was a little cheap just as far as like a oh, you know, secret thing that you could have never expected or planned for happens that turns the tide of battle. Um I felt like that was a little unfair from this kind of storytelling that we get. If you're saying if you're saying the uh, criminals didn't play fair, I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> if you're saying they cheated, I'm going to say, yeah. It, no, it's, it's it's less of them, the characters, cheating. It's more of just the, the story narrative. Like, we couldn't have accounted for Jody, right? Sure. From, from watching the movie, all the context and stuff. We couldn't have accounted for that character, yeah. who very much so turned the entire tide of this story. Mm-hmm. Um. So that's 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 where I'm putting that in kind of the the unfair categories that we we get a you know a surprise cameo character of <laughs> Channing Tatum yeah. just showing up and then uh, causing mischief that still kind of ends up being inconsequential but right it does very much change how you know the rest of that movie plays out yeah so you're saying you wanted to learn about him if, a if we at earlier. least had an inkling that he was going to be there, be around, anything, yeah, I think would have been good. It it works very good as like a surprise, mm-hmm. um, but just for how much like breadcrumb context we got on everything else so far, I just felt like that was a you could have never seen this coming, which works good as a twist, but also I just would have liked that hint, maybe, yeah, just just a little bit of something to be like, oh, there's the guy that we knew he was someone was around there. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah. I can't imagine the... Uh, I didn't realize... Um, like, the first time I watched it, if I'm not mistaken, I think Channing Tatum's, like, one of the names, like, in the cast. Like, of just, like, Channing Tatum. And you're like... The fuck? <laughs> and so then you watch all the way through, and I feel like you almost forget that Channing Tatum was even supposed yeah. to be Well, in it's it. the same thing with uh, uh, Leo in uh, Django Unchained. Right. Like, I saw yeah. him in the title card. I was like, oh, shit, Leo. I, I forgot. forgot about him immediately after until we saw him on screen. I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Dr. Evil. Leo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and, and I, I guess that's even what it is, right? It's like, you know it. I guess that is right. They gave you the hint that there yeah. was going to be him somewhere. And I guess they pretty anchor it. Like, everyone is just in the cabin. I think so it's where's, one of where's those. Where's Chad? And he's in the cabin. That's Maybe that's on me. I think it's one of those where you think, uh, you're like, oh, well, certainly the whole movie won't be from this cabin, you know, and they'll leave here later. Yeah. Uh, when it just turns out, like, we get another cabin. <laughs> There's a cabin below the cabin. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. yeah. This is actually just a sequel to Cabin in the Woods, Cabin in the Mountains. Oh, God. You know, I did watch that, uh, and I, I don't know. I just was kind of like, eh. Yeah, the concept uh, is neat. I like that they use the same house from Evil Dead, or the sure. same cabin from Evil Dead. You know, there was a lot of callback stuff from Cabin in the Woods, but, uh, hmm. yeah. Hmm. 
I would have just liked to see more monsters have screen time because a lot of them were kind of neat. Sure. The concept was kind of interesting, but yeah, probably worked better as a TV show. Mm. You know, monster of the week kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Uh, my my only last thing isn't so much a conversation point. Just uh, probably the coolest shot of the movie is Daisy hanging from the ceiling with John's arm still handcuffed to her, also hanging. Yeah, and I like. the <laughs> songs play and it's talked about being hand in hand too. Yeah, like it was just very very satisfying. Uh, just the the classic like ending of a Tarantino movie in just a fucking shit show bloodbath. Yeah, you know, you know. Warren's on the bed with a fucking bloody patch of his nuts. You know, the, the blo- co- bed's covered in blood. Mannix is all like, you know, bleeding and laying on the floor. Crumples up the Lincoln, <laughs> the Lincoln letter, yeah, right? right? Uh, yeah, just there's, always, always good last shot there. Yeah, it's, there's got to be a term for it, like corpse crawl or something, you know, where we just we go across and we look at all the dead body aftermath. I'm also thinking about. Um, uh, the one with the fucking rail gun thing, the guy. Oh, oh, um, fucking from from Django. With, with no, the no, rail gun? no. I'm I'm thinking of the the one over. His oh, in taxi, uh, taxi taxi driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Taxi driver. Yeah. God, I couldn't think of what it was called. I'm, yeah. I'm bad. Um, <laughs> but you know, like we got that awesome slow crawl out. Yeah. Uh, you know where we see like all the bodies and all the carnage and stuff. There, it's it's yeah. it's so satisfying. Uh, I think just to to end on those notes where it's like everybody's gone. Yeah, it's so good. Yeah, is it? It's cooler than Taxi Driver too, because like, just the way of like, you know, he was like talking to him the whole movie about how he's alone, no one gives a shit. Yeah, and then he's like still alone in this room, having done these things, killed these people, and as you're backing out, and then like all these people are coming to see the spectacle of what it was he was involved in. But here's all the people, but he's still alone. And that's, I don't know, that was interesting to me. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that was the hateful eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last yeah. note I did want to touch on, though, was just kind of around the, the score in general. Um, yeah. I really love it when movies integrate, um, like, music in scene uh, as, you know, just like the score going on for like a bit of dialogue. So as Bob's playing the piano... Um, you know, and, yeah, I, I love that so much. It just, it felt so genuine and just the, damn it. and then, you know, go back, restart or whatever. Um, and then when Daisy's playing the, uh, the song on the guitar and we can kind of see, you know, them making the coffee in the background and, you know, the, the focus changes just a little bit to let us know that she's kind of just waiting to see what happens. Cause she knows, um, I just, I think stuff like that is so incredibly satisfying when it's just like in context yeah. score. Um, you know, being provided by the characters, yeah. Um, especially when there is just like something else going on that we should be paying attention to. It's it's nice, and then especially as it being, oh, well, it couldn't have been Bob because Bob was playing the piano during the conversation. We know that, yeah. You know, so even working that into the the plot just it makes it so interesting. I love it when shit like that happens. Yeah. No. Yeah, it was really cool. I even like how I like I like how Bob got all into it at the end, where he's like. Da-da! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just gotta love the floor. She was probably like remembering the song as he went around. He's like, oh yeah, I remember this. It's all coming back to me. Uh, so as far as just the thoughts that didn't really fit anywhere aren't really conversation points, but uh, everybody's just cool throwing all kinds of liquids all over the floor. <laughs> John Ruth walks in, just tosses the whole pot of coffee out. Yeah. You know, uh, it's 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 hardwood. It's fine. He's just throwing, you know, soup on Daisy. Uh, Poor yeah, fucking like, Daisy, man. I mean, it was just it was so fuck like, you know, fucking Warren. You know, he doesn't even hesitate to drop his cup of coffee when he goes to pull out the gun. Yeah, and, you know, it's like no respect for the indoors. No one gives a shit now. You know, Daisy had a no hat rule. I wonder what her no coffee rule was. Honestly. <laughs> Uh, but apparently she didn't care because, I mean, you see Gemma plucking the chicken in the beginning and she's just tossing feathers all over the yeah, floor, no, right? Yeah, there no, so. there's no cause for concern there. One <laughs> one thing I wanted to bring up, too. So uh, when Bob came in uh, with everybody else, right, when it was the gang? Right, yeah. Um. So why was she cool with Mexicans in that exact moment? <laughs> Judy. Yeah. So, you know. No, I, I be, because of Judy, I think. Why Minnie was cool with a Mexican in that scenario. Yeah. You know, because she knows Judy well and I all guess, that. Yes, but like... It I just, don't know, that's all. I'm just 
trying. I don't know. Yeah. I'm just also, if you cared enough to have a sign that said no Mexicans, you know, in your your haberdashery, which is just the coolest name for anything. Yeah. Uh, if you cared to have a sign like that up, uh, I I would think. Uh, you know, you you might say something, or at least have a little bit of like, a, uh, are we letting him in? Really? He can't. He can't <laughs> wait outside with the dogs. Well, it's funny. She started letting dogs in, so we we took the sign down. It was like, can't you just cut the sign in half? Yeah, <laughs> that's literally, or just cross out dogs. I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, yeah, no, that's a hole for sure. Um, but Unless I guess he was just, maybe she was just like, because she took the sign down, she was like, ah, fucking got me on a loophole. Yeah. <laughs> ah, it's not his fault. He doesn't know. I don't like Mexicans. <laughs> It'd I'll, be too weird to bring it up now. I'll put a new sign up. Um, uh, get, no, I said the thing about throwing the gun parts out in the snow rather than the outhouse. <laughs> See, what would have made that part a little bit more fun, I think, is if you gave everyone just the one like type of gun. So it's like you get all the barrels, like you get all these other pieces. So then there's like that aspect of like a random people going to have to work together that aren't on the same side if they want to assemble a gun and have a fighting chance kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah, it, it would have required a very different movie for that to work. But that's where my brain went. It was like, oh, we got to get like, you know. Uh, fight for survival, you know, unlikely pairing kind of stuff here uh, to get like our guns a, back. Uh, sounds like kind of a, if there was a Hateful Eight video game. A little bit, right? It's like, okay, now go down the, <laughs> go, out, go out to the outhouse and rappel down and <laughs> dig through the shit to find the, yeah, I don't know. Uh, Quick time events, hit X to dig. <laughs> <laughs> You're mashing it. <laughs> shit flying everywhere you walk back in the other character come up with a story of why you smell like shit dialogue wheel <laughs> i was in shit i slipped in shit i went into the shit tunnel that's just my stank <laughs> i have bad bo we all do. um yeah no I, yeah, that's all i got you have any other thoughts that didn't fit anywhere live tweets if you will uh i gotta say i just really really enjoyed that we ended on the lincoln letter i just thought that was like such a nice little yeah uh you know period at the end of all this was just the thing that you know kind of got a lot of the stuff spinning off you know yeah we we earned a lot of trust i think uh with warren by having that so uh yeah and then just the hmm, nice touch at the end there you know with uh old may or yeah. uh sure is that her name May or uh Old Maggie Sue. Mary Todd. Mary Todd. God, go. I'm bad yeah. with names. Uh, I don't know <laughs> I all the to, president's wives. Neither do I. I had to think of uh, I had to think of how John Ruth was saying it in the wagon. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, it, they, you know, it was just like, ah, oh, that was a nice touch, you know, especially when you look at it from like the, uh, you know, this is a fake perspective. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's like, yeah, that, that was a nice touch. It really does send it. <laughs> yeah, I thought so too. <laughs> yeah. Uh can you think of what the uh, uh, stagecoach said on it that OB was driving, what the company was? Oh, shit, I don't. I remember reading it at one point, too, but nothing clicked with me. Butterfield Overland Stage Company. No st significance, just, I was just, you know, quick thing. Gotcha. It would have been interesting if that was another, like, odd tie into something else that had been in the movies, because why the fuck not, you hell, know? But hell, Yeah, I didn't do a ton of research on this, because <laughs> I didn't have the DVD for the special features and all that, but, oh, yeah. maybe it is, I don't know. Uh, and I think maybe my, yeah, I forgot I wrote a couple things down here. Go for it. After the fact. It was just, uh, I, <laughs> I love a couple quotes, right? <laughs> I'll bust you right, I'll bust you in the mouth right in front of these people, I don't give a fuck! That was the most, like, it felt like out of time period line of dialogue where I was just like, this is just genuine hate for this lady. It made me you think are not even <laughs> acting. You are just mad at this actress. It made me think of, uh, you know, I think you should leave that, uh, whatever they call it. They do that, like, goofy movie preview and, like, Santa Claus is playing the yeah. one dude. And he's like, uh, he's like, I don't give a shit if I die at all. <laughs> Um, uh, Mannix, y'all having a bounty hunter's picnic? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, when he intimidates, uh, Mannix in the wagon and he's already like 
inches from him and Mannix is pretty much already against the wall and he like moves a quarter of an inch he's like I'll just cozy up to this here window and dream about how lucky I am let this carriage rock me to sleep (laughs) I was like that is the most successful back pedal I have seen in a while (laughs) He had a, another good one uh, there where it, uh, it was like him and Warren, you know, they had everyone up along the wall yeah. and uh, Warren's like, you know, talking about his theory stuff and, and Mannix is like, or we go by my theory and it's the ugliest guy who did it, which is you, <laughs> which is you, Joe Gage. I was like, ah, oh, that's so good. Uh, and then uh, uh, that's the thing about war, Mannix. People die. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> When I elbow you real hard in the face, <laughs> that means you shut up. <laughs> there are so many just solid lines just out of context that I hope to use in my real life. Yeah. Uh, not that one. My wife is safe. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, hey, that was the Hateful Eight. And uh, this is Content Crisis, right? So subscribe to us on uh, you know Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Um like comment subscribe all that horse shit um you know uh hit us on the twitters or the instagrams we're at content crisis one uh you know we try to post clips and stuff like that and uh yeah email us content crisis hotline yahoo.com if you have uh questions comments concerns suggestions you know anything uh if you just want to write a big piece of hate mail we'd love that we'll we'll, read it we'll read it right here (laughs) All right, so thanks for listening, watching, whatever, and goodbye.